After nearly 100 years of laboring through the fires of persecution and bloodshed, all the while their chief object being the preaching of the gospel and the communication of the word of God in a language the people could understand. The English Reformation arrived at what many believe to have been their finest achievement. The translation of the King James Bible in 1611. Since 1526, there was a rash of Bible translation and Bible publication, and it all came to a screeching halt uh, after the King James Version of the Bible. They finally got it right. They finally, because as we follow through, Tyndall only gave us the New Testament, though he did uh, Genesis through 2 Chronicles and Jonah, but they were published individually. They're never in the Bible. So Coverdale took his work and then added, translated from the German and uh, from the Latin and makes the first English Bible. However, it's not completely from the original languages. So John Rogers comes and, and he takes all of Tyndall's work and puts it in uh, there, but he has to use some of Coverdale. And so we get done with that and finally uh, we get to the Geneva Bible, and the Geneva Bible does all the translation from the original languages, so, uh, but, it, but it, in my opinion, it's still a little rough, though it's based on the Texas Receptus and the Hebrew Masoretic text. It's very close to the King James, but I can see where there's some rough spots. So now you have the King James. It's all of the Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek stuff, and uh, it is accepted. In the preface to their work, the King James translators wrote to the reader in which they spoke of those translators and translations which had come before them. They said, We acknowledge them to have been raised up of God for the building and furnishing of His church. Therefore, blessed be they, and most honored be their name, which helpeth forward to the saving of souls. And we would look to translators who, like uh, the preface to the readers, the AV translators sought him that hath the key of David. And they were humble men, and they were scholars, but they were spiritual men. The King James Committee deemed it important to confess their faith that the Holy Scriptures were given by inspiration of God. Inspiration refers to the author, holy men God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. That's the original. Concerning the Greek and Hebrew Scriptures, they said, the original thereof being from heaven, not from earth, the author being God, not man, the editor, the Holy Spirit, not the wit, of the apostles or prophets. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, uh, Pasagrafe Theonoustos, so God gave it, the church recognized it. In their preface, the King James Committee also said, truly good Christian reader, we never thought from the beginning that we should need to make a new translation, nor yet to make of a bad one a good one, but to make a good one better, or out of many good ones, one principal good one. That hath been our endeavor, that our mark. They went on to say that, to that purpose, there were many chosen that were greater in other men's eyes than in their own. These men, everyone had to be so skilled in the languages that they themselves had to do the translating. This was a team technique unsurpassed either before or since. 54 scholars were originally chosen but it is said that only 47 of them actually took part. What followed over the next seven years was perhaps the most ingenious, the most detailed, the most exhaustive and systematic translation process ever conceived or carried out. So they had, uh, uh, they called them companies, they had six companies. Uh, in three different cities in, um, in London. It's called the Special Team Technique. Each of the men had two divisions, each of the teams had two divisions, the Old Testament, New Testament, in the team. 
and they had a very ingenious method of translating. They had every, they, they had an average of seven men per team, just to take that as an average. They went through every word of the King James Bible 14 times. Here's how they did it. Each man and the team had to translate for himself that portion of Scripture, Old or New Testament, assigned to him. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven different translations came in and they met at their team and they went over everyone's translation. Which is the best? Throw out the bad, keep the good. That's the eighth time they went through in the team. Then the King James was very specific. I want you to take what you have in each team and give it to the other five teams. So here's eight and five is 13 times. The other teams went into it. When they looked at things and they wanted to change some things, they didn't agree with these teams. Then they had a 14th time at the end of the time when it was finished, two from each of the teams, 12 men, the leading men at the final went over everything. And so there were 14 times everyone went through. And that wasn't the end of it because the king was very specific. Uh, each of the bishops or leaders of the Church of England had a copy of this draft of the King James Bible. And they sent these bishops, sent to everyone in their, in their uh, charge who were skilled in Hebrew, skilled in Greek, to go over this and see if there's any problems that they had and to give that information to these teams and these three different cities, uh, the six different teams. And that was the way the thing was done. Their method that there was used was two things, verbal equivalence and formal equivalence. Verbal equivalence meaning they wanted to translate Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek words into English words. Not uh, messages or thoughts or ideas, but they want to have words and words wherever possible. Formal equivalence has to do with the forms of the words. They wanted to be as surely as they can of a noun in Hebrew, Aramaic, or Greek, put it over in a noun in English. Pronouns to pronouns, adjectives to, to adjectives. Uh, they didn't want to have dynamic equivalence, which is add, subtraction, change of the words of God. They didn't want to change any of these things. In addition to its detailed translation, the King James Committee was instructed to keep the footnotes of the new Bible to a minimum, only providing cross-references to other scriptures or brief notes on the original languages. Because of its simplicity, trusted accuracy, and the poetic beauty of the language, in time, the King James Version would overtake all the other English translations. It ultimately, down the road a little ways, replaces, not right away, but down the road replaces Geneva Bible. People had a rough time giving up their Geneva Bible because it was like a study Bible, you know, uh, but then there wasn't any need to do that. English Protestants would become very familiar with the Bible and its doctrines, and the King James translation would come to symbolize the unified efforts of all the Reformers who had hazarded their lives for the sake of the Word of God. The authorized version of the Bible is seen as almost as a unifying text for English Protestantism, um, produced in 1611. This is, this is the first edition of the King James Bible, and what actually happened in the first instance, of course, it was produced to be put in churches. So as you can see, it is a very large folio volume. And I just opened it at the beginning of the Gospel according to St. Luke. That's the, this is the final chapter of Mark. An angel declareth the resurrection of Christ to three women. Christ himself appeareth to Mary Magdalene, to two going into the country, then to the apostles, whom he sendeth forth to preach the gospel, and ascendeth into heaven. Sometimes called the best-selling book of all time, there is perhaps no other version that has brought about more controversy. The translation was no sooner completed than it came under attack by Romanists and some Protestants. One scholar in particular, a Puritan named Hugh Broughton, said he would rather be torn to pieces by wild horses than to impose the King James Bible on the poor churches of England. Yet there are other curiosities about Hugh Broughton. Dr. Matthew McMahon writes that he was highly esteemed by many of the learned Jesuits, and though a bold and inflexible enemy to popery, he was offered a cardinal's cap. In centuries past, 
the Jesuits were known for seducing men with money and laudation. And it was not uncommon for someone to outwardly oppose Rome while secretly supporting their cause and doctrines. But could this have been the case with Hugh Broughton? The famed English poet, John Donne, who would become the Dean of St. Paul's in London and who lived during this era, recorded the following in one of his letters. He said, A gentleman that visited me yesterday told me that our church hath lost Mr. Hugh Broughton, who is gone to the Roman side. I have known before that Serarius the Jesuit was an instrument from Cardinal Baronius to draw him to Rome. According to John Donne, Broughton was offered a stipend to avoid controversies with the Catholic Church. It seems that he cooperated to some extent, since he compelled his congregation to refrain from conflict with Rome. We read that he often urged them, saying, study your Bibles, labor for the edification of one another, be peaceable, but popery you have no reason to fear. It will never again overspread the land, but keep your hands clean and keep clear of the quarrel. To modern eyes, Broughton's words are curious, especially when one considers this image of Rowan Williams, the Archbishop of Canterbury and religious head of the Church of England, bowing down to Pope John Paul II and kissing his ring in 2003. Or this image of Britain's Prime Minister, Tony Blair, signing the Constitution of the European Union beneath the gigantic statue of Pope Innocent X. The agreement was signed on Capitoline Hill, which is one of the seven hills of Rome. Could these things suggest that Rome's Counter-Reformation continues even today? I believe that the Counter-Reformation continues to this day, yes. I think there are a number of um, indications of that. Britain is, of course, part of the European Union, and the European Union, although it's based in Brussels, is uh, very definitely a Vatican uh, project, and is described as such by a researcher named Adrian Hilton in the book The Principality and Power of Europe. Very definitely a, a, a Vatican counter, ongoing counter-reformation tactic. Just before leaving his office as Prime Minister, Tony Blair had a private audience with Pope Benedict XVI in July of 2007. This was a meeting the Prime Minister was unlikely to miss. His visit to the Vatican was to be his last foreign engagement. Significant, certainly to some Catholics, and though today there was no mention of whether he might one day convert, there are plenty who think he will. Which perhaps explains the Prime Minister's choice of gift. In the frame were photographs of Cardinal John Henry Newman, a former Anglican priest who did convert to Catholicism. In the 19th century, he was a major figure in trying to bring the Church of England back to its Catholic roots. John Henry Newman is a very significant character in the history of England, Rome, and the Bible. In a nutshell, he is the perfect symbol of Rome's counter-reformation. Newman began as one of the Protestant leaders of what was called the Oxford Movement in the middle of the 19th century. The Oxford Movement, which began in 1833, was an attempt effectively to Romanize the Church of England and to get the Church of England away from the Scriptures and back to the ritualistic practices of Rome. Some believe that a parallel to the Oxford movement is the current emerging church movement in America today. In the emerging church, where people are being encouraged to go back and find the experiences of the past that brought people to church, where are they being led? To Roman Catholicism, to statues, idols, icons, incense, these various kinds of things contemplative Christianity, going back and studying the monastic disciplines. None of this is in the Bible. The inerrant Word of God is under attack by people who have ideas and beliefs that are unscriptural. 
Such was the environment of 19th century England. John Henry Newman was one of the leading lights of the Oxford movement and caused many Anglicans to turn away from the Church of England and convert to Roman Catholicism. Newman himself became a Catholic priest and was eventually made a cardinal. Two of his chief admirers were Brooke Foss Westcott and Fenton John Anthony Hort. It was these two men who developed a new Greek manuscript in the late 19th century, one that would radically change the world of biblical scholarship. But what was their real intention? For over a hundred years, debates have continued about their work and whether or not it was a deceptive effort. This is not what they claim it to be. They claim it to be being the version set forth in A.D. 1611. It is not. It is an entirely new translation based on the new Greek text created by Westcott and Hort. Considering that both men spoke favorably of the Oxford movement and greatly admired Cardinal Newman, is it possible that Westcott and Hort were somehow a part of Rome's counter-reformation? It is curious that their revised Greek text would be further developed by the nestle Allen Committee in the 20th century, whose members included Carlo Maria Martini, a Jesuit priest who would also become a Roman Catholic cardinal. To more fully consider the significance of a Jesuit priest on a Bible committee, we look to the year 1825, shortly before the beginning of the Oxford movement and to a famous meeting of Jesuit leaders in the town of Chieri, Italy. The meeting was recorded by a Jesuit initiate named Abate Leone. In his book, Leone records how the Jesuits spoke of the great work, namely the raising up of the church, the salvation of the world, and the union of all sects and parties under the authority of him who, as the representative of God himself on earth, cannot but act in the interest of all, on condition, however, that all consent to obey him. As part of their plan for world domination, Leone wrote that the Jesuits intended to take control of the Bible. In particular, one Jesuit superior said, then the Bible, that serpent, which with head erect and eyes flashing, threatens us with its venom, shall be changed again into a rod as soon as we are able to seize it. For you know but too well that for three centuries past, this cruel asp has left us no repose. You well know with what folds it entwines us and with what fangs it gnaws us. And the main target is the crowning achievement of the Protestant Reformation, which is, of course, the 1611 authorised King James Holy Bible. That is the fruit of the Reformation that the Jesuits want to destroy above all, because until they do that, they cannot be sure of getting, uh, indeed, the entire world, and especially England, uh, back under the thrall of the popery. 18 years after the Jesuit meeting in Chieri, a German scholar named Constantine von Tischendorf would travel to Rome for what he described as a prolonged audience with the Pope. One year later, Tischendorf arrived at St. Catherine's Monastery at the base of what is called Mount Sinai in Egypt. Here, he discovered a manuscript that he claimed was more ancient than any of those used by the reformers. In time, and after further visits to the monastery, the manuscript he found would be named Codex Sinaiticus. Oddly, it had more corrections or changes in it than any other manuscript in biblical history. Tischendorf claimed there were some 14,800 corrections done in the manuscript. Is that true? It sounds about right. Sinaiticus is the, the most corrected manuscript of a Greek manuscript of the, the scriptures. 
Years later, after Tischendorf published the manuscript, a copy would be presented to Pope Pius IX. The Pope would send a letter in which he expressed his highest appreciation of the publication. About this same time, a second manuscript emerged from the Vatican Library, named Codex Vaticanus, the Vatican Book, also said to be more ancient than the manuscripts used by the reformers. Vaticanus has a very, now has a very strange appearance. When you look at it as a sort of manuscript expert, although you know that people tell you that it's a, it's a fourth century manuscript, it actually looks like a 15th century manuscript. And there's one very simple reason for that, is that almost the entire text has been overwritten by a 15th century scribe. Vaticanus and Sinaiticus are the two Greek manuscripts that would be embraced in the 19th century as older and more reliable than the texts used by the reformers. Westcott and Hort would combine them into what is now known as the critical Greek text that would be used for biblical translation throughout the 20th century. According to the Vatican website, Cardinal Martini completed his studies in theology at the Faculty of Theology in Chieri, Italy, where he was first ordained a priest in 1952. In 1967, with the help of a man named Eugene Nida, the United Bible Society entered into a UBS Vatican Agreement to undertake hundreds of interconfessional Bible translation projects worldwide using functional equivalence principles. The term functional equivalence is another way of saying paraphrase. Many believers have expressed a concern over the progressive use of paraphrase in the newer Bibles, with each edition becoming farther and farther removed from the original languages. Since the scripture says that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God, how do such changes impact the faith that was once delivered to the saints? Luke 18 and verse 8, I believe it is, when the Son of Man cometh, will he find faith on the earth? That word faith, which is pistis, is articular with an article. Hey, pistis, the faith. Will he find the faith on the earth? And I, every time in, in the Greek language, in the New Testament, whenever the faith is mentioned, means the body of doctrine held by the churches the doctrine of the deity of Christ, the bodily resurrection, the blood atonement, the miracles, all these doctrines, the faith. And so that is implied he will not find the faith. As it says in other portions of Scripture, there be uh, deceivers deceiving and being deceived, all these different signs of the last times. In October of 2008, delegates from the American Bible Society presented Pope Benedict XVI with a special polyglot Bible that bears the seals of the Vatican and the American Bible Society. The American Bible Society also publishes the Contemporary English Version, a newer Bible that has now completely removed the word Antichrist from its translation. In its place, they use the term enemy of Christ, which removes half the original meaning. Anti has two meanings in Greek. Anti means instead of and also against. The Antichrist is against the Lord Jesus Christ and he's instead in replacement of the Lord Jesus. And to have a, a version like the CEV, contemporary English version that takes away Antichrist and all these things, it's making provision for this man who calls himself God, as it says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the man of sin who says he's God and goes into the temple, says and maintains his deity, that's Antichrist. How these prophetic events will fully unfold, only time will tell. But the understanding of Bible prophecy will surely be affected by how the words of God are translated. Some are even predicting that a new international Bible is being planned, one that will completely omit the book of Revelation. Through various Bible societies, the Vatican now influences biblical translation 
in hundreds of languages around the world. The question that all Christians should ask is, after a thousand years of persecuting and killing the saints for reading the Holy Scriptures, has Rome now turned over a new leaf? Or is she simply pursuing new tactics to achieve an ancient agenda?